Morning, church. Hey, you know how when you get a song stuck in your head, you can't seem to get rid of it? What's really bad is when you wake up with a song in your head, you can't get rid of it. But it was a good song. The song is called Holy Forever, and it's a new one by Chris Tomlin. If you haven't heard it, um, look it up. It's a really good one. But it got me thinking about Revelation 4, verse 8. And it says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That verse kind of, I mean, I don't know how to say it. To be holy means to be exalted, to be fully. It's a great song. The Lord is faithful. Yesterday, now, and always. I was over at uh, Grandview Cemetery yesterday for a service. And so uh, I walked over to where Pastor Joe and Della are buried and uh, just stood there. Their little grave site is well tended, nice flowers. And uh, I just always uh, like to go there when I'm in that corner of the cemetery and just remind myself of, of um, all that he did that makes it possible for me to be here today and to just rededicate myself to be God's man in, in this generation. Uh, we all have a calling. We all have a purpose. And uh, we're, not, we're not doing the same things Pastor Joe did 40 years ago but we're following the same Lord and we're obeying his voice as we go. Well, tomorrow here in Austin, there'll be people at the cemeteries, uh, a lot of families, but also uh, the, uh, the Legion guys will be there and they will honor the dead who died for our country. And um, it's a good thing to be part of. A fellow named Jeff Greenfield wrote about the little town He's from in Connecticut, Salisbury. He says every year at 10 a.m., the parade moves down Main Street. It's led by some vintage cars that have the oldest veterans in them, and then other veterans walk behind, and they're followed by a town band, and by scouts, and by children, and finally the fire trucks. And everyone else in town uh, lines up on the street, and they're Welcome to fall in behind the fire trucks and walk over to the cemetery there. And in the cemetery, they'll sing a hymn and they'll have a prayer. A young person will read the Gettysburg Address. And then someone will read the names of all the local service members who died in both world wars and in Vietnam and Korea and more recent conflicts. A minister will recite the 23rd Psalm a bugler will play taps, and a flag will be raised from half-mast to full-mast. There aren't any speech writers. There's no TV cameras. There's no politics. It's very simple. It's very sincere. And he says, every year I'll look, and I'll see someone wiping away tears. He says it's very fitting that people stand and listen to the names read of people that they've never met because those are the folks, that, as Lincoln said, who gave the last full measure of devotion. They paid the highest price. They took part in a story bigger than their own plan for their lives. And it's fitting that we show gratitude on Memorial Day for those who died and for those who were left behind and had to go on without them. Once a year, uh, we take time to do that. And it's a decent and right thing. And so tomorrow, there'll be a, a, a service at the uh, Veterans Memorial by the old courthouse on Main Street at 8 o'clock. There'll be another one at the uh, Oakwood Cemetery at 9 o'clock. And uh, if you can go, it's, it's meaningful. Some of our teens go because the high school band plays. And I think it's a very good thing. 
It's been a privilege for me to be part of it in the past. Most of the folks who fought America's wars did not start out to be soldiers. That wasn't what they wanted to do with their lives. Uh, most of them had other jobs and, and callings that they left aside. It's true today of the National Guard. We're grateful for those who, who are basically on call anytime, anytime they're called, they're ready to go. And during World War II, it was especially true of the nation because 16 million people in America served in the military in World War II. That was a roughly 10% of the population. It was a quite a time. Young adults stepped away from their lives as mechanics or truck drivers or salesmen or farmers or students or teachers, a host of other things that they had set out to do with their lives. And they answered the call to duty. They left behind their parents and sometimes wives or husbands, children and friends, life as they knew it. And many will tell you in any war that when they came back, they weren't the same person as when they left. Uh, they had lost something. They had lost some part of their life. They had lost some part of, of their, their well-being, being in war. A man named George was part of that in World War II. He was a commercial artist in New York City. He had never even driven a car, but he was put in the Army Air Corps, and he was flying missions to support the ground troops after D-Day. On his 67th mission, he was shot down and killed. He left behind his wife, Betty Lou, and a child that he had never met. And like thousands of other kids, that little boy grew up never knowing his dad. It's happened over and over. And we have Memorial Day to say thank you. By the way, we're down to less than 1% of World War II vets who are still alive. I saw a fella this week who had a cap on World War II vet, and I, I said thank you. There are going to be many more opportunities to say a personal thank you to the veterans of that war. And the numbers from the Korean War and the Vietnam War, they're going down too. We're grateful for those among us who paid a price. Whether they died or whether they're with us now, we're grateful that they did what they were called to do. We can't always explain everything in a war, but we're thankful for those who do what they can to make America the country it's meant to be. There are things God tells us to remember. 200 times in the Bible, it talks about remembering. There are things God specifically tells us to remember. And it reinforces uh, biblical values and it strengthens us in character when we do. Last week we talked about the Passover. God said to remember the, the time he delivered Israel from slavery when he opened the Red Sea for them to pass through. He said, I want you to remember this every year on this day of this month forever. And it's been 3,500 years and the Jewish people are still celebrating Passover. And Christian people ought to be doing it as well. Uh, not necessarily the Jewish way, but remembering what God has done. And so today I wanna go back to where we left off. Uh, they left Egypt, they left slavery. They, they went in, into the desert. God sent a cloud and said, you just follow this cloud. Whatever direction it goes, you go. And so they did. And God positioned them in an exact spot where he wanted them. They were up against the Red Sea. There was a mountain on their right and a mountain on their left. And behind them was the road that they had come and the road that Pharaoh was right on pursuing them. And when they realized Pharaoh was after them, that he had come out of Egypt to, to haul them back, uh, they were afraid and they were frustrated. They were, they were dumbfounded. They, they felt trapped. They were trapped. There was no way to escape and there was no way they could fight. And so here they were, exactly where God told them to be. But they couldn't see any reason why they should be there. And so they were panicky. But Moses said, you just be quiet and you just watch. God put us here. Let's see what he's going to do. And he opened the Red Sea for them to walk across on dry ground. 600,000 men with their wives, their children, their parents, all their flocks and herds, millions, millions of souls walking across 
this sea. And when the Egyptians tried to follow, uh, the walls of water came down and destroyed them. The destroyers were the ones destroyed. And the Israelites never had to look over their shoulder again to see if Pharaoh was going to come after them. It wasn't going to happen now. That's what God did. That's what they remember. And that's what we, uh, we remember. That's the kind of God we serve. And he led them out into the harsh desert. He led them through a variety of, of experiences until they reached the land that he had promised to give them. And when they got there, they refused to go in. They sent out some explorers to see what was happening, and they realized, oh, these people are big. Oh, their walls have big, their cities have thick walls. They, they have armies. We're not an army. We're a bunch of escaped slaves. We don't know anything about war. We don't have any organization uh, other than our religion. Uh, the, the Jews, the Egyptians, they just kind of told us. They had the government. They had a structure. They had a culture. And, and we just were slaves. And now all of a sudden, we're supposed to fight against people who, who've uh, been fighting each other for centuries. How are we going to do it? They weren't, they weren't willing. And so God told them, well, then... You can go back into the desert. Take a walk. Think about it. In fact, take a long walk. 40-year walk. And so the, off they went. And God said, now I'm, I'm going to leave you in the desert until all the grown-ups in this generation have died. And I will bring your children into the land that I promised to you. Can you imagine being an old guy in that crowd? You know, you're celebrating your 74th birthday and, uh, and there's a cake and your family's sitting around and you realize they're just waiting for me to die so they can go in the promised land. You know, it's getting down to where, hey, there's about 20 more guys, you know. They're probably tempted to throw a banana peel down or something. I don't know, but it must have been a miserable thing to realize I'm holding them up. And we don't want to ever be that way. We don't ever want to be the ones holding people back from, from what God has. Now, God was in charge of the timing, of course. But the time came when they came back to the edge of the land that God promised them, their future home. And this time they obeyed. This time they went in. And this time they weren't being pursued by the Egyptians. But this time they also faced a body of water. It wasn't a sea. It was a river. It was the Jordan River. Jordan River, not huge. It's not a mile across like the Mississippi. It's about the size of the uh, river here in town, the Cedar River. And it, but it floods. And you've seen the Cedar River get pretty big. And it happens in the springtime in Israel sometimes worse than others. And so the, the river was overflowing its banks. And the people had to cross. They had to bring their children and their grandparents. Well, not too many old people, I guess. But they had to bring their flocks and their herds. And uh, God said, don't worry, I'll open a way. He said, take the Ark of the Covenant, this box that they had the Ten Commandments in, and have the priest carry it and walk into the river. And as soon as they stepped into the water, the water stopped flowing. It backed up. I'm not sure how, but the water just stopped flowing. And it dried off. And the people could walk across and again, a couple million people, flocks and herds and all. And off they went across the river. God had made a way. And uh, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them to take twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. And so Joshua picked twelve husky guys. He said, each of you pick up a rock. First of all, they each picked up a rock and they made a pile in the middle of the Jordan. The priests were still standing there. The water was not flowing. They left a little pile of rocks in the water that would be covered up when uh, the river started flowing again. But they also took 12 more. I suppose they helped each other. Now, even a big husky guy, how big of a rock can he carry? But the, a buddy would help him get it up on his shoulder and he'd carry it up away from the river and they piled them in a certain spot. They made a stack of rocks. Not something you would see naturally. Not something that would just happen 
on its own. And the reason was they wanted people to, to, to notice them for years to come. Joshua explained, your kids are going to see this pile of rocks and they're going to realize somebody did this on purpose, this stack of rocks. And they're going to ask, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them the story. You can tell them the story, like you do on Passover, where every year the youngest child in the family who, who's old enough to ask, asks the question, why is this night different than any other? And now, what do these stones mean? God wants us to be the teachers of our children and our grandchildren when it comes to his plan, his story, his, his work through the years. These stones, Joshua said, will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. I'm not sure that the stones are still there. I've never heard that they found a pile of stones that they think is the right one. Um, but I do know this, that it, it exists in the scriptures. It exists in our memories, that we know that it happened and that we remember what God did because of it. God intended for the people to remember that event in every generation that would follow. It was a visual reminder. It was uh, clearly intentional, and it was meant to be a landmark that kids would ask about and learn from. We build memorials in our town, in our generation. We have places in town that are meant to remind us of certain things. We've even, even got signs saying this is how high the water was in 2004, right? We just want to remind ourselves of things, mostly good things that have happened. The Bible says, then you can tell them, your children, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so that all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful, and so you might fear the Lord your God forever. <clears throat> there are several times in the Old Testament where it talks about all the nations of the earth. When David fought Goliath, he said, I'm sorry, Goliath, but you're going to die today, and all the nations of the earth are going to know there is a God in Israel. God wanted people all through the centuries to know who he was, and he was introducing himself uh, through the Jewish people at that time. The Bible is packed with stories of how God worked uh, in the past. God wants us to know what he's like by knowing some of the things he's done. And so we read the scriptures to see what is God like. Again, one of the good questions to ask when you pick up your Bible is, who are you, Lord? Show me who you are. Show me what matters to you, what values are important to you, what your plan is, and how powerful and faithful you are. He's a God who keeps promises. And he wants us to know and remember how he forced Pharaoh to let the slaves of Israel go, how he opened the Red Sea so they could walk through, how he provided water and bread, the manna, in the desert for 40 years, how he kept their, uh, them alive and protected them from enemies, how he stopped the Jordan River so they could go into the land he gave them, how he knocked the walls of Jericho down and fought for them in various ways. There was one time where God sent bees and the, the enemy is out to fight them and all of a sudden they're getting stung on their ear and their knee and their, under their arm. And, and it's hard to fight when you're being stung by a bunch of bees. <clears throat> God just fought for them. Another time he threw hailstones down. Uh, God fought for them. They, didn't, they were never on their own. <clears throat> and so it's important for us to know what God put in the Bible. Whether or not you generally enjoy history, God wants you to pay careful attention to his story. He wants you to know what he's done. He wants you to know what he said. He wants you to know what he's promised because it's important in your life. And in the past 2,000 years since the Bible was complete, we've had a lot of people uh, record their experiences with God. We have biographies from all these generations of people who said, this is how God taught me to pray. This is how God provided for me. This is how God healed me or kept me or gave me what he promised. This is what the God is like. It's important to read the scriptures. It's important 
if you're a reader, to read biographies. There are a lot of them are on film now. And say, God, what you've done before, you can do again. I love that song we sang. And you can bless others by writing things down. You can record something. You can make a note of an answer to prayer or an event that God did or how he protected you, how you came through a scary experience. Uh, some people do it uh, intentionally. Um, I know at least one in our church who wrote out a, a biographical a book for their family to have, to say this is where, this is where our dad uh, met God. This is how God worked in his life. And it'll be a treasure, it'll be a heritage, it'll be passed down. I remember when my grandpa died, he, he was living with my dad. My dad gave me a grandpa's Bible that he'd been reading it that season of his life. <clears throat> it was a big, thick, uh, large print Bible, extra large print. It was a, <clears throat> a living Bible with the green padded cover, some of you remember. And grandpa had read it from cover to cover. And so when I got it, I began reading it from beginning to end. I paid attention to the verses that Grandpa underlined. They weren't really straight lines, but he underlined important verses. And he wrote things in the margin. Sometimes he would write, thank you, Lord, T-A-N-K. He was, he was from uh, Denmark. Thank you, Lord. Uh, one time when it talked about Paul being the chief of sinners, he put me. <laughs> and things like that. Just things that showed me something of Grandpa's heart as I read God's word. When I finished, I gave it to my son as a family heirloom to, for him to, to read and hopefully pass on. Uh, it's important for us to remember what we've learned from people who've been on the road longer than us. I remember going back to Michigan when I was a young man, sitting next to Grandpa in the church I'd grown up in, Little Bethel Baptist Church, and someone got up to sing Whispering Hope. And Grandpa was was a very polite and, and dignified man in that way. But he leaned over, and not really in a whisper, he said to me, I've got more than a whispering hope. <laughs> I'll never, ever hear that song without thinking of my grandpa. If you just say the name Whispering Hope, I'll think of my grandpa. He had hope, but it was more than a whisper. And uh, I love it. There are things like that that all of us have that we need to hang on to. And I pray, Lord, give me the faith and the courage to do what my grandpa did, to follow you wherever you lead. When he was 22, a newlywed man, he left his homeland and came to America. Didn't have any money, uh, had people that he knew of, no real friends, no one with them, and started a whole new life. And when we sing America, America, I'm an American because of that choice that he and grandma made, and I thank the Lord for it. And I want to do things in my life that will benefit the generations that follow me. Don't you? And that's what Joshua was all about. He said, I want you to show people what God has done because they will experience God in other ways, and they need to know that he's faithful. The Bible tells us everything that was written in the holy writings long ago was written to teach us. By not giving up, God's word gives us strength and hope. So read the Bible. Read the stories. Read the old and the new. Let it become part of your mind, your point of reference. And, and remember other people and the things that you've learned from them, recent or, or far back. There are folks that I've never met that I I look forward to meeting in heaven because uh, they've touched my life in a very real way. And remember what God has done and rely on him to do what he needs to do now. He hasn't run out of ideas. He hasn't run out of power. He hasn't run out of love and commitment to us. And his word introduces us to all kinds of things and people. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, it re refers briefly to a number of people who experienced God in their generations. Here's one of the paragraphs. Through faith, they fought whole countries and won. They did what was right and received what God had promised. 
They shut the mouths of lions. They stopped fierce fires. They escaped being killed by the sword. They were weak, but became strong. They were mighty in battle and defeated foreign armies. Through faith, women received their dead relatives raised back to life. God did all these things for his people who followed him. But the next paragraph goes on to tell of different kinds of experiences that followers of Christ have had. Others, refusing to accept freedom, died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. Some were mocked and whipped, and others were put in chains and taken off to prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went around clothed in skins of sheep and goats, poor, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not good enough for them. They wandered like refugees in the deserts and hills, living in caves and holes in the ground. What a record all of these have won by their faith. Some people trusted God and followed his plan in great victories. And they brought him glory because he made it possible by his constant presence and his power. But others suffered terrible mistreatment and their faithfulness under extreme pressure brought glory to God because he made that possible by his constant presence and his grace. God wants us to remember people who have brought him glory in both kinds of experiences, some triumphant and some painful. And these heroes shine as examples for us to follow. And we don't have to go all the way back in time. In our own generation, there are examples, some older than us, some younger than many of us, who are walking with God, who are paying the price, who are taking steps of faith, who are role models that we can follow. The Bible tells us, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Look at how things turned out when somebody walked with God. Look at how it ended when someone obeyed his voice. Look at what God did when he had someone willing to put themselves in his hands and imitate their faith. Do the same thing. He wants us more than to do more than keep a memory alive. He wants us more to do more than say something nice about those people. He wants us to live. He wants us to live the same way for the same reason. That's our calling. Live that way. Live for that reason, the way they did. God is worthy of our deepest trust and our fullest obedience. He's worthy. He's worthy. As Mike shared from the uh, book of Revelation, he really is worthy. So let's be people who remember the things God tells us and value the things that he values and learn from the examples he's preserved for us and put around us. And let's live our lives in a way that does the same, that honors him, brings him glory, makes him known. What do you think? We're going to sing another song then and we're going to give ourselves to the Lord.
The son sent me a picture last night, him and his wife standing with their oldest son, Caden. He just graduated from college yesterday, Bethel University up in St. Paul. Uh, his mom and dad met there as freshmen and went to Bethel and got married. Um, I graduated from there 49 years ago. And I just think, you know, I made a decision back then to uh, go to a school 600 miles from home. I had no idea that it would have an influence on my kids and my grandkids. But uh, Caden's little brother is going to be a freshman there next year. And God is just working through the generations. And uh, when I was there, it was pretty new. Uh, I actually started on the old campus right across from the fairgrounds. And uh, we moved up there. I, I, I helped move the bookstore. But uh, all these years later, God is working. And, and uh, I just want to encourage you with this, that the, the things you do, the patterns in your life, the decisions that you make, have more influence than you know. And they may carry on. And something you write down may be a treasure to somebody 100 years from now. And so let's walk with God. As we remember the people in the past, as we remember what God has done through the years, let's say, I want to be part of it now. Amen. I'm going to walk with him today. Right. I'm going to make a difference. Amen. And someday, I'll be part of God's story in, in a great, great thing. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to as well, don't we? Because right. God is already there. Amen. Lord Jesus, help us to walk with you this week. Help us to be faithful. Lord, show us things we can share with others that would encourage them as they see what you've done in us, through us, around us, for us. Help us, Lord, to, to draw on others and to be one that can be drawn on so that your glory would be lifted up and your name would be glorified in our generation and far beyond. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Titles made.